So this is the second of two videos I'm recording for the Head Start Summer School about polygons, polyhedra, and polytopes in higher dimensions. Um, so the first video is about counting symmetries, um, and that focused mostly on polygons and polyhedra in 3D. So in this video, we're going to be talking more about polyhedra in 3D and polytopes in 4D, so the higher dimensional generalizations. So in the last video, we saw some very nice, very symmetric polyhedra called the regular polyhedra. The regular three-dimensional uh, polyhedra. Uh, so another name for these guys is the platonic solids. So the word regular here refers to the, the group of symmetries of these objects. And it says it's very large. So here's a more precise statement. So regular means the following. A polyhedron is regular if any two flags in the polyhedron are related by a symmetry. So what's a flag? Here's a flag. Um, I pick a point, like this red vertex here. I pick an edge that contains that point, And I pick a face that contains that edge. So what that gives me is something that looks like this, which is a triangular flag with a stick holding it up and sort of a point where that stick sticks into the ground. So you think of this as like a flagpole with a flag sticking off the side. That's the, the reason for the name. Okay, so regular here means there are enough symmetries that any two flags that I pick inside this polyhedron are related by a symmetry. So let's just do an example. Uh, here's another flag. I pick this vertex and this edge and this face. Okay, so to get from the red one to the blue one, those are two flags, I just have to... I don't want to be straight, I want to be curved. I just have to rotate by 120 degrees. And it turns out any two flags are related by some combination of rotations and reflections for this tetrahedron. Okay, so that means the tetrahedron is regular, that's what it means to be regular. And the amazing fact is, it turns out there are precisely five regular polyhedra in three dimensions. Um, five. Okay, so there's the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the icosahedron, the cube, and the dodecahedron. So I want to sketch an idea of how you might go about showing that there are exactly five uh, platonic solids in 3D. Um, and then your, your task will be to generalize that argument to 4D and see how many polytopes there are, regular polytopes, in 4D. So here's how it works in, in 3D. First of all, note that if all flags are symmetric, as in if there's a symmetry taking any flag to any other flag, that in particular tells you all the faces are the same, because every face is contained in some flag, just pick an edge in a, a vertex. Um, and um, so any two uh, faces are related by a symmetry. So all the faces look the same. Step one. All faces look the same. Moreover, the faces have to be regular polygons. Regular in the same sense that a flag... So a flag in a polygon is just going to be a vertex and an edge. Um, and that, so it follows from this, the fact that all flags look the same, that not only do all faces look, look the same, but they're all, uh, all faces are regular polygons. So this is the nice fact about this definition of regularity is that because, you know, because a flag contains a face or an edge from each dimension, from a sort of zero-dimensional point, a one-dimensional edge, and a two-dimensional face. It's somehow very amenable to inductive arguments where you sort 
it work down a dimension. Um, OK, so all faces are regular polygons. And we know the regular polygons, they're just the triangle, the square, the regular pentagon. In other words, they're determined by the, um, the number of edges. So let's say uh, each face is an, uh, a regular n-gon for the same value of n. We'll say what n can be later on. Moreover, all vertices look the same. Right, because every vertex is contained inside some flag, so I can get a symmetry taking one vertex to any other vertex. All the vertices look the same. In particular, we have at each vertex uh, some number of n-gons meeting at that vertex. In the case of the uh, tetrahedron, we have uh, three triangular faces meeting. So in this, so e.g., for the tetrahedron. We have n equals 3, so there are three gons or triangles, and there are three uh, so they meet in threes at each vertex. So let's say there are, um, I need another letter, m. So m n gons. meet at each vertex. OK. So the question is, what values of m and n could we possibly have? Um, the answer is going to turn out to be there are five possibilities. Um, so we've seen for the tetrahedron, n equals 3, the triangles, and they meet in threes, so m equals 3 as well. Um, for a cube, let's, let's just do the example of a cube. What do we have? We have um, three squares meeting at each vertex. So there are three four-sided things meeting at each vertex. So m equals three and n equals four. Um, OK, so we've got to try and put constraints on the values of m and n. So the way we do this is we think about angles. So um, in a triangle, equilateral triangle, all the angles are 60 degrees. They're all exactly 60. So if I look at the total angle around the vertex of a tetrahedron, it's actually 60 plus 60 plus 60 because we have three triangles meeting at that point. So um, let's just have a, a look up here. In other words, what I'm saying is if you look, if you count the total angle around the tetrahedron, around this vertex, you get 60 plus 60 plus 60 at the back, which is uh, uh, 60 plus 60 plus 60 is 180. So for a tetrahedron, total angle at each vertex is 60 plus 60 plus 60, which is 180. And that's different if you look at a point in the plane, we know the total angle around a point in the plane is 360 degrees. So this is less than 360 degrees, and that's why in a tetrahedron that point is kind of a cone point, right? It's sort of a... This is like the vertex of a, a, a cone or a pyramid at that point. Um, if we look at a cube, the total angle is 90 degrees plus 90 degrees plus 90 degrees. Uh, total angle equals 90 plus 90 plus 90, which is 270 degrees, and that's still less than 
360 degrees, which again is why we get this sort of very sharp cone point at the corner of a cube. So in terms of M and N, what is the answer? So first of all, you have to remember the formula for the internal angle of a polygon, uh, which I always forget, so I always have to work out from first principles. So let's see that work and see how that works here. Um, so if you've got, uh, say, a triangle or n-gon, um, you imagine starting pointing in this direction along the bottom of the triangle and then you get to the vertex here and you rotate by this much, let's call that alpha, until you're pointing in this direction. And then when you get to the next vertex, you have to rotate by alpha again until you're pointing in this direction. And finally, you have to rotate by alpha a third time until you're pointing in the direction you started. And when you've done that, you've turned by 360 degrees. So in other words, three lots of, or sorry, n in general, this is n lots of alpha equals 360. And the internal angle, let's call that beta. Um, well, beta equals uh, 180 minus alpha. Um, which is, so what is alpha? Let's rearrange this. Alpha is 360 over n. So we get 180 minus 360 over n. Or if you prefer, um, you could say this is 180 times n minus 2 over n. Just multiplying, add, adding fractions. Okay, so that's the internal angle here. Um, let's just check if, if n equals 3, we get 3 minus 2, that's 1, over 3. So 180 over 3 is 60, which is correct for an equilateral triangle. So the total angle at each vertex of our polytope is, well, we have m of these guys meeting at each vertex. So we just get m times this. So 180 m over n times n minus 2. So for example, if we are in the case where three things meet at each vertex and they are triangles, then we're getting 180 times 3 over 3 times 3 minus 2. So that's just 180, which is what we had in the case of the tetra uh, tetrahedron. Whereas if n were 4, so you have squares meeting, this would give you 180 times 3 quarters times 1. which is 270. Okay. So the main point of this uh, result, this fact that there are five platonic solids, the main point is that this total angle at each vertex has to be less than, strictly less than, 360. Imagine what happens if the total angle at a vertex is equal to 360. You know, for example, if um, let's just let's pick an example where this happens, something like uh, m equals six and n equals three. Right. In this case, um, m over n is two and n minus two is one, so we just get 180 times two, which is 360. So, what goes wrong when this total angle is 360? Well, what happens if you try and put six triangles, equilateral triangles, around a point? You end up with this configuration of triangles. Which is a perfectly nice configuration, sitting in the plane, tiling the plane. You know, you can keep going and adding these triangles, and they're going to tile the plane. So you're never going to close up. Imagine trying to build this, imagine you have some triangular tiles and you're trying to build this uh, three-dimensional solid whose faces are triangles and with six around each point. You try and build it and you just end up building a tiling 
of the plane where it's sort of like a, a honeycomb type pattern except with triangles and you, you keep trying to build it and make it close up but it's never going to close up so it turns out it closes up if and only if the total angle at each vertex is strictly less than 360 so we need total angle less than 360 in other words we need 180 m over n n minus 2 to be strictly less than 360 so if we divide through by 180 um, we're going to get and maybe just multiply by n to make it slightly simpler m times n minus 2 has to be less than 2n so now we can try and list all the possible m's and n's for which this inequality holds so the key thing that helps us here is that m the number of shapes meeting at each vertex has to be at least three if you try and fit two things around a vertex it's going to kind of end up being flat imagine you have two triangular tiles and you try and fit them so that these two vertices match up the only thing you can do is stick this edge to this edge and this edge to this edge and at that point they're just going to be flat against one another and that's not going to give you a solid either so m has to be at least three so this inequality we have something like you know at least 3n on this side except for this minus 2 and 2n on this side and the 2n is supposed to be bigger so this inequality looks kind of difficult to satisfy and that's how we get this restriction so let's let's say it like this so if m is at least 3 then the left hand side of this inequality is at least um, is at least 3n minus 2 and that's still less than 2n so let's multiply this out we get um, 3n minus 6 is less than 2n so that if we reorganize it that's telling us n is less than 6 strictly less than 6 so remember n is the number of sides of a face so um, we can have triangles we can have squares we can have pentagons but we can't have hexagons so these are the only three possibilities for n and it's not too hard to imagine if you had three hexagons they would tile the plane just like these triangles did so that's what goes wrong okay so now what you can do is you can say okay if n equals 3 what are the possible values of m well we still have to satisfy this inequality so m n minus 2 is now equal to m because n is 3 and 2n is equal to uh, 6 so again m has to be less than 6 so you could have uh, it also has to be less than uh, bigger than 3 sorry. so uh, you could have m equals 3 triangles you could have m equals 4 triangles 5 triangles but you couldn't have 6 triangles because then you run into this problem that they just tile the plane and this is going to give you the tetrahedron the octahedron and the icosahedron respectively those are the solids that have triangular faces similarly for n equals 4 you're going to just have uh, the cube there's only one possible value of m which is m equals 3 and for n equals 5 if you work this out you're going to just have m equals 3 and that gives you the dodecahedron okay so that is how you prove there are five platonic solids at most five platonic solids so your task is to generalize this argument we've just seen to four dimensions now what could i possibly mean by that well here's a quick introduction to four dimensional space so in three dimensions you need three coordinates to specify the positions of a point you need an x coordinate a y coordinate and a z coordinate just like in in the plane you need an x and y coordinate 
that's two dimensions. So this is a three-dimensional picture and if I want to specify a solid in three dimensions all I need to do is specify um, a bunch of points like for example um, let's say this point on the x-axis at 1, 0, 0 this point on the y-axis at 0, 1, 0 and this point on the z-axis at 0, 0, 1 and maybe um, the origin as well at 0, 0, 0 Okay, and if I specify those four points, all I need to do is to take all the possible lines joining them connect those with lines and then fill in the triangular faces and then fill in the interior so this is an operation called taking the convex hull it's like the the smallest convex shape that contains all those four points um, so this is not a regular tetrahedron I've drawn this is just a a, a tetrahedron that's not regular um, how do I generalize this to 4d well I introduce a fourth coordinate let me do that in blue. So this point is no longer 1, 0, 0. This is 1, 0, 0, 0. And this is no longer 0, 1, 0. It's 0, 1, 0, 0. The origin has four zeros and 0, 0, 1 gets an extra 0 on the end. So you imagine that I've, I've now introduced another axis that I can't draw. Um, so what I'm going to draw instead is another slice of this space. So you imagine this, this 3D thing I've drawn is a slice of this four-dimensional space where the fourth coordinate is zero. All these guys have zero in the fourth entry. So what I'm going to draw is another slice of this space where all the coordinates have one as the fourth entry. Uh, so this, this point here uh, at the origin of the new axes is now zero, 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 one. So you can think of this fourth coordinate as time, if you like. Some people like that. Uh, it doesn't need to be time. You could think of it as colour, right? If you think of, like, frequency, that's a number that you can interpret as a colour. And a number at each point is like an extra parameter. It's just a number, right? So the point is 4D, it's just you've got an extra coordinate to play with. Doesn't mean you can visualise it. It's just how you work with it. So here's an extra point, and what I'm going to do is I am going to add that in to my convex hull. In other words, I'm going to take all the possible lines, oops, let me make it straight, in 4D that connect um, from the original vertices to this new vertex. And all the possible points in between. So if you want formulae for this, first you should think about how to get formula for the the red guy so um, you know one way of thinking about this is in in this red guy the x coordinates y coordinates and z coordinates of all the points in this red region are positive so um, x y and z are positive or non-negative and everything sits behind this this triangle we've got at the front which turns out to translate into the inequality x plus y plus z is less than or equal to 1. Right, so in particular if x equals 1, y equals 0 and z equals 0 then the sum of those equals 1 and that's exactly uh, allowed because this this point here is in our in our polyhedron. So if you want to generalize this same thing to 4D you just add in the condition that the t coordinate or whatever you want to call it is positive and that if you add it into the sum it's still less than or equal to 1. So these would be equations for a four-dimensional, or inequalities for a four-dimensional polytope, which is some kind of generalization of a tetrahedron. Again, not a regular one. So let's ask ourselves, what are the analogues for this four-dimensional object of the faces of a polytope, uh, polyhedron in 3D? Well, before we do that, we should ask ourselves, like, back in two dimensions, when we had a, a triangle, what are the faces of a triangle? Well, they're the edges, right? So in 2D, for example, 
for a polygon it's faces which I'm now going to call facets because you, you tend to think of face as being a two-dimensional thing so facet is is a term that applies in any dimension so it's facets are one-dimensional edges for a 3d shape we've seen that the faces or the facets are two-dimensional polygons so for a 4d polygon or polytope the facets are 3d polyhedra So one way of thinking about this in terms of these inequalities is a facet is where precisely one of these inequalities becomes an equality. So um, let, let's just think about, for example, um, just look at the red guy um, and forget about all the blue lines. When x equals zero, then or let's say z equals zero, then you're in the xy plane and you get this, uh, I should redraw it really, shouldn't I? Um, so here's my 3D example. When z equals zero, which is exactly when one of these inequalities becomes an equality, um, then you get this bottom triangular face. When x equals zero, uh, you're going to get this face over here. And when um, x plus y plus z equals 1, you get the triangular face that's at the very front. Um, okay, so similarly, we should get the 3D facets of this 4D polytope by assuming we get inequality, equality in one of these inequalities. So, for example, this red uh, tetrahedron is one of the facets of our 4D shape here. So the red tetrahedron is the t equals zero facet of the 4D shape. How many facets does it have? Well let's think how many inequalities are there that we could turn into equalities well, there are one, two, three, four, five inequalities. X positive, Y positive, Z positive, T positive, and X plus Y plus Z plus T less than or equal to one. So there should be five facets. And this red thing we've drawn up here is the, the T equals zero facet, but there should be an X equals zero facet, a Y equals zero facet, etc. So there should be five tetrahedral facets of this four dimensional shape. Let's try and draw one of them. I'm going to draw the x equals zero facet. Um, so which points in our diagram have x equals zero? Well, this point has x equals zero, this point has x equals zero, this one doesn't, this is x equals one. Um, but this point at zero, 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 one, off in the fourth dimension, that does have x equals zero. And certainly the origin has x equals zero. So we just connect up with lines all the guys that have x equals zero. And some of those lines are now going to go off through the fourth dimension. And what you get is a tetrahedron, you see? This has got a triangular face and then it's got a point that's connected to those points in the triangle by these lines. So that that is a tetrahedron, but it's sitting in such a way that it passes off into the fourth dimension has a, a cone point here at zero 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 one so this is the x equals zero facet All right so whereas before we had polyhedra whose faces were triangles and things now we have 4d polytopes whose facets are tetrahedra cubes that kind of thing.
So if you're interested in regular 4D polytopes, which is what we want to classify in this um, project, your faces are going to be regular 3D polytopes. So there's only five of those we've already seen. There's only five possibilities. And those five possibilities are the, the analog in, in this dimension of the different choices of n in the previous um, calculation. Right, because n was telling us what shape to put on each uh, face of the, of the polyhedron. So we need to know what the analog of m is. How many facets can we fit in uh, a given position? So for polyhedra, the right question was, how many faces can we put around a vertex? And the answer was, well, we can only put so many that the total angle is uh, strictly less than 360 degrees. So what's the analogue of that in four dimensions? It turns out the right question to ask is, how many facets can you put around an edge? So let me just draw in the um, t equals zero facet here again this one. You can see these two tetrahedra share this orange face, uh, this triangle. Um, and just as in, in 3D any two faces share a single edge, so um, let, me, let me draw in this picture, this blue guy and this red guy intersect along this edge and exactly two faces intersect along an edge. Similarly in 4D exactly two facets intersect along a, a, a two-dimensional uh, face. Um, so then the analog of a vertex rather than being a vertex the analog is an edge. So these two guys share an edge here, they share an edge here and they share an edge here. These three orange edges. Uh, are in common between these two facets. Here's another facet. I I apologise if you're colourblind or something. I'm I'm going to do this in um, uh, let's see, pink. Uh, so here's here's another facet. This is the um, z equals zero facet. Okay, so it's got this edge, this edge, oops, this edge and these edges. That's another, oh and this one. That's another facet. And what does it have in common with the uh, the red facet and the blue facet? Well let's see. Um, so uh, which of these edges are all three colours? Which edge is uh, red, blue, and pink, I think it's just uh, this one here that I'm doing in green, just to be really colour friendly. So the, in other words, the y-axis. Okay, because remember, this this is the x equals zero facet. This is the t equals zero facet, and this here is the the uh, z equals zero facet. Um, so in coordinates, if x is 0, z is 0, and t is 0, the only possibility is for y to be non-zero. So that's the only edge you could have contained in all three facets. Um, so sometimes it helps to draw pictures and sometimes it really helps to write things in coordinates because uh, you, you run out of colours or you run out of brain space. Um, so here we have three facets meeting along an edge. Um, so, what's the analog of the total angle here? Well, if you look at a tetrahedron and you look between two of the faces, there's a kind of dihedral angle, it's called. Um, it's maybe easier to understand for a cube. If I draw a cube um, and I pick two of the square faces, you can kind of see there's a, a 90 degree angle between this top face and this side face here. They meet at 90 degrees. So the dihedral angle along this edge is 90 degrees. For a cube. 
So for a tetrahedron, there's a particular value for the dihedral angle. For the icosahedron, the dodecahedron, the octahedron, they have dihedral angles, which you can calculate or look up. And so the analogue of um, our condition from before is that the total dihedral angle along every edge should be at most 360. So from that, you should be able to figure out which polyhedra, which platonic solids you can fit together to form four-dimensional regular polytopes and how many of those you need along each edge. Um, and there should be a finite number. It should be a relatively small finite number. Um, and once you've done that, you might like to think about what happens in five dimensions or in six dimensions. Um, So just to summarize, the challenge is to classify four-dimensional regular polytopes. Um, by enumerating their faces, the possible faces and the possible number, sorry, facets, and the number of facets that you could have around each edge. So when you finish this challenge, if you're still interested and excited, um, you could go back and think, in the last video at the very end, I set a challenge about the Archimedean solids and their symmetry groups. Um, and so Archimedean solids are like regular, except instead of every flag being the same as every other flag, every vertex is the same, just the vertices. Um, so that's a, a weaker condition. Uh, so you get more of them. Um, and so you should be able to apply the same kinds of arguments we did for the uh, for the platonic solids to classify the Archimedean solids. So instead of just having triangles around each point, you can now have triangles and squares and other things. Um, and hopefully you should recover the same classification that uh, you maybe looked up last time. And if you get really excited uh, about you know, four dimensions and stuff. You could also ask yourself, what what are the possible four dimensional Archimedean polytopes? Which is a much much harder problem. It wasn't solved completely, I think, until the nineteen sixties by Conway and Guy. Um, and there's there's a lot of them. Um, so I I don't think you'd be able to solve it yourself necessarily, but uh, you could at least go and read about it. There's, there's lots of examples. If you want to read about it, they're called uniform polytopes. The Archimedean guys are called uniform polytopes um, instead of regular. So that's it from me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed thinking about some of these things and if you have any comments or questions or if you make any progress on the challenge questions do send me an email at j.d.evans at lancaster.ac.uk. I'm always happy to hear about what you're doing.